Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I begin, I just want to take a minute or two to just explain what I will be discussing. Uh, I am uh, talking about how uh, Zoroastrians in the Sasanian period mainly attempted to reconstruct their past. Uh, when they did it, how they thought about it, and how much do we know? Perhaps the paper is more about how much we don't know than how much we know, because people like myself pont pontificate quite a lot about how and how they constructed the sacred history. So that is what the talk is about, okay? Approximately at the time when Muhammad ibn Jarir al-Tabari was compiling his Tariq al-Rasul wal-Muluk, Adurbad Emidan was compiling the Dinkard, and along uh, with other Zoroastrian sages, they were attempting to redact the important Pahlavi texts. Thus, the coming of the Abbasids and the establishment of Islam appears to have propelled many to write a history of the past according to their communal perspective. This includes uh, Christians and Jews as well. This, of course, had already begun during the late Sasanian period for the Zoroastrians. It seems necessary to put to pen the events of the past so that the leaders of the community of those of the good religion, Behdinan, would be able to pass down their memory to the future co-religionists. In this new sacred historiographical report, which the Dinkart IV is the best known source in terms of sacred narrative, the two most important polarizing and devastating events is the coming of Alexander and that of the Arabs. One killed Magi's and tore asunder the Avesta and brought doubt and heterodoxy, so much so that even with the coming of the Sasanians, high priests such as Kerdir, Adurbad Meher Spandan, and Vehshapur had to go through ordeals and make journeys to heaven and hell and meet deities to establish an orthodoxy, if such a thing ever existed. The Arabs, in turn, invaded Iran Shah and stayed there, where they spread their religion and weakened and enfeebled the good religion. Certainly, our authors believe that no calamity compared to this uh, that had befallen Iran Shah and the Zoroastrian religion. It was now up to Adurbad Emidan and others to retrieve the scattered knowledge and the commentary on the Avesta to bring yet again the lost orthodoxy amidst the rampant heterodox movements. If we are to follow Patricia Crona's new work uh, entitled Nativist Prophets, indeed there were many of these heterodox movements, including those led by Sonbat, Babak, Ishaq, al muqanna Beha Farid, Ustad Sis, and a host of other motley prophets, transmigrators of soul and time, which had all sorts of Zoroastrian elements attached to them. Indeed, if there was a time to put to pen the events of the past to protect the true history of the good religion, it must be now amidst the religious chaos in the relative calm of Baghdad. As de Menash observed long ago, as Islam was gaining grounds and epics were being absorbed into the Persian literature in a Muslim-like garb, there was an anxiety to preserve what was important for Zoroastrianism. Thus, in the ninth century, a history or memory of the past was redacted in response to Islam at the moment that the Islamic histories were appropriating histories of the conquered people. So namely, again, Tabari, Dinawari, Hamza al-Isfahani, and others, who were indeed stripping the nature of this Persian past. But this process of Zoroastrian history had begun in the Sasanian period, certainly by the sixth century, when a history was put into writing, where now a literary along an already existing oral tradition side by side was retelling the stories of the past where one was fixed while the other was changing continuously. In this talk, I intend to discuss the way the religious and mythical or historical traditions were used in order to construct a new history 
in late antique Iran. By late antiquity, I'm talking about between 206 or 700 CE or AD. Initially, I had made up my mind that I would say something about perhaps before the sixth century, and I will in some ways, and the refashioning of the past. Now, when I started writing this uh, paper, I think uh, we can say very little about the time before the fifth century BC in terms of what the Sasanians historically believed in or what they inherited in terms of historical knowledge. In fact, if we are honest, one can not say anything concretely about the historical memory of the Iranian people before the fifth or sixth century of Common Era. Even someone like Arthur Christensen, whose historicizing tendencies is well known, had stated, I quote, the vague idea that Persia had been in continual warfare with the Greeks is perhaps the only remembrance which we had uh, which uh, had remained from the Achaemenid times, i.e. the past, meaning not much of a historical memory. One should, I think, always look at the work of the older scholars because they have said much of what we try to say again. And this is what uh, Christensen had already said in 1931 on his book on the Kyanids. Let us see what the evidence is for the third century with the establishment of the Sasanian Empire where there seems to be a change in religious ideology, even though our ancestors or other, I'm sorry, though our sources are late in this regard. Professor de Jung's sober skepticism uh, raises some important points which we take, I think, for granted. I'd like to reiterate the now much discussed notion that the, that the early Sasanians and the Sasanian inscriptions in the third century, specifically Shapur I's Naqshar Rostam inscription, uh, there the king of kings, that is Shapur I, could not recount more than three of his generations before him, his ancestors, Ardeshir Babak and Sasan. So his Ahinegan, as in Middle Persian, or ancestors beyond this point, cannot be established. And there are hundreds of articles about this and several books. And none of it is convincing, I think. Why, by the time the Middle Persian texts, these are the late Pahlavi texts, the Bundahish in the ninth century, and Tabari, approximately the same time, uh, what we have is a detailed genealogy of the Sasanians, uh, which was constructed, that goes all the way to the past, to the distant past, to give legitimacy to the Sasanian king, of, well, to the Sasanian kings and the dynasty. Ardeshir Babakan, uh, in his genealogy, at least in the late Sasanian, early Islamic period, uh, he is connected to Daraye Darayan, which could be Darius III, most probably, the last Achaemenid king, or as Akhtar Sherba has suggested, the conflation of the last Achaemenid king of kings with the memory of the kings of Persis, since we had Daraz, uh, as they are found in uh, Pahlavi texts. Uh, and again, this after all, is a late 6th or 7th century compilation. And as the Karnamagya Ardeshir Babakan, the Vitae of Ardeshir, the son of Babak, uh, suggests, um, as Franz Grenet has also mentioned, is, was a reading staple of the late Sasanian or the Abbasid court. And I think Antonio has given uh, interesting dating in regards to the text itself. That is, the text is late. In the Karnamagya Ardeshir Babakan, the gentleman right here that you're seeing, his coinage and the rock relief. It is said that Ardeshir is from the Nafe Darai Shah, from the lineage of King Dara. But this is a late source and an epic romance. And as a historian, I'm talking here, of course. So we can only turn to the, perhaps the Manichaean papyri, which Heinrich and Conan edited and published, which provides the tantalizing name Dariv Ardakhshir for the founder of the Sasanian Empire. This has uh, made some waves and people discuss this because they say at least an alternative source and earlier perhaps is relating uh, the last uh, Achaemenid king to Ardeshir. But this papyri is a fifth century work. So even the papyri is late, is not from the time of Ardeshir. Then what do we know of what the early Sasanians knew or said of their past in the third century? almost nothing. Everything is basically guessed. 
Um, the classicists will turn to us and say, well, Ammianus Marcellinus and then Herodian in the fourth century turns and tell us about how the Sasanians make proclamations that you know, this part belonged to our ancestors. But that's within the context of classical historiography. They may be refashioning this based on their knowledge of the Achaemenids. We don't know if the Sasanians are saying, in fact, these matters. It is in the late fourth century and through the actions of Shapur, who you're seeing here all the way to the right-hand side, the second, that changes begin to develop in Sasanian views of themselves and probably their past. Again, I'm saying probably, so you see I'm still on shaky grounds. Shapur II, after 350 CE, middle of fourth century, turned his attention to the east, as the Chronicle of Arbella has, gives us some interesting information, and probably defeated his foes and established Sasanian uh, domination over the Kushans. So uh, Eastern Iran mainly now uh, going to this Indo-Iranian borderlands. Uh, the two Middle Persian inscriptions that we possess from the time of Shapur II mention his eastern boundaries, that is the boundaries of the Sasanian Empire in the east, to, see, to Sindh, Sistan, and Turan. Again, that is not clear. Amianus, uh, writing almost at the same time, lists the provinces of the Sasanian Empire and gives us this uh, very deep Sasanian incursion uh, into the east. So where he mentions the Bactriani, the Sogdiani, uh, Scythia at the, mount, at the foot of Emmaus, uh, and beyond that, Arukhazia and Gedrosia. Finally, most of the gold coins minted by this gentleman who you are seeing his rock relief uh, are from eastern myth such as Marv, where the Kushans also minted coins. So it's based on this evidence we can probably say that, yes, he was present in the East, and it's the first time the Sasanians have made this deep inroads into the East. And I should say there's a large quantity of now copper coins uh, that are uh, known from the time of Shapur II, which are, again, from the mints of Sistan and Kabul, so exactly where the Kushans are, at least in Kabul, and that's where we're finding this gentleman's, or this king of kings coinage. It is also during Shapur's, or Shapur II's rule that we, with regards to Zoroastrianism, uh, we hear of the towering figure of the fourth century, namely Adurba de Maharspandan, which is credited with some sort of codification of the Avesta and the weeding out of heresy. Again, here Dinkart 4, uh, beside Dinkart 3, is a, a very good source. I quote, Shapur, the king of kings, son of Hormoz, induced all countrymen to orient themselves to God by disputation and put forth all traditions for consideration and examination. After the triumph of Adurbad, through his declaration put to trial by ordeal, which all those sectaries and heretics were recognized, uh, who recognized or studied the Nasks, uh, parts of the Avesta, he made the following statement. Now that we have gained an insight into the religion and the worldly existence, we shall not tolerate anyone of false religion, and we shall be more zealous. Thus, it appears that there was a great synod or council, at least if we can get from this passage, in which all people, Middle Persian Kishvari Gan, probably meaning Zoroastrian theologians as well, discussed the Zoroastrian material available, it is clear that there was difference of opinion because we are supplied with a host of terms for different Zoroastrian sects, Jodri Stagan, those of different groups, Jod Sardagan, and those who study the Nask, Nask Oshmurdan of the Avesta. In the apocalyptic uh, Pahlavi literature, Shapur II is fondly remembered as the one who arranged the world or gave, arranged law or religion, Dad Araid, and made salvation current among the creatures, Bukhtagi Paddaman of the world. And Adurbad is remembered as the restorer of the religion, Din Rast Virastar, against the heretics, Jodri Stagan. Shapur II, with the aid of Adurbad, probably attempted to bring about order and doctrinal unity in the Zoroastrian religion. No doubt, the threat of Christianity induced the king of kings to not only persecute uh, Christians at the time when they were uh, proselytizing, uh, but also create strong Zoroastrian structures for his co-religionists. Still no history, I think, in terms of the construction for this time. So it's in the fourth century and with Shahpur that I would suggest several important developments is are taking place. One may suggest that the Sasanians are being reintroduced 
to this Eastern Iranian world. And there are some suggestions that, in fact, they're encountering the uh, epic tradition and perhaps the Avestan tradition or some form of uh, the tradition that existed in the Avesta. Uh, secondly, I think Zoroastrianism begins to have some sort of organization more concretely, which is in reaction, of course, to Christianity. And it's at almost the same time the Talmud is being composed. And third, finally, this is just my uh, fleeting suggestion, I would suggest that Persian became an important language uh, which in time became the lingua franca of Central Asia and Greater Khorasan. The big question is when did Persian take hold uh, in this uh, Central Asiatic or Greater Khorasan? And I think this deep incursion of Shapur II and um, stationing is the beginning of this process uh, in mass. By the fifth century, as a result of encounter with the East, uh, resulted probably in the Sasanian uh, adoption of Avestan names as well, and titles. Uh, I will just read some of these uh, fifth century kings. Kavat, Kavus, titles, Ram Shah, Kai, and then of course the name of the great, one of the last great Sasanian kings, Khosro, uh, are all connected with this sacred, either you want to call it epic or the Avestan tradition. And of course the inclusion of the word Khware, on the coinage of Khosrow, I don't think it's on this coinage of Khosrow, but uh, it appears from uh, the 11th year of the year of, uh, of the reign of Khosrow, that is 610, uh, I think is a further indication with this preoccupation and this interest in this past of, this, the, of the Iranian world, that something had changed in the <coughs> ideological orientation of the Sasanians uh, in the fifth century. On the other hand, Dialogue and interaction with Jews and Christians from the time of Yazgird I to Yazgird II, and these are fifth century monarchs. Biblical tradition uh, related to Achaemenids began to be reminded to the Sasanians as their ancestors. This we have to accept if we are to believe Christian and Jewish sources, where the memory of the past, that is the Achaemenids, were put forth to the king of kings. We're told that in 544 CE, 6th century, a Nestorian ecclesiastical council called Khosrow I the new Cyrus. But how much of this type of statement affected the Sasanians, we cannot tell. They could have used such a propaganda when needed, but in all effects we hear and see is different, where the world of the Avesta and its tradition has taken hold with the Sasanians. Now this could be the oral tradition and not a text necessarily. Talking about the Avesta and its dating is a daunting task at the moment and I wouldn't even dare to say anything, but my uh, colleague and friend Johann Vivina never lets me forget that the oldest Avesta manuscript is from the 14th century. And uh, Jean Kellens' recent article on the Achaemenids and the Avesta uh, he has, again, uh, given some interesting ideas and also uh, said that even the term itself, uh, Avesta, and anything such as a book is from the Sasanian period. It is a Sasanian production. But if we also take the idea that the Avestan alphabet was being invented also in the fourth century during the time of Shapur II, then there was a good moment to have an Avestan book come into being by the fifth or sixth century. By the sixth century, when Khosrow I ordered the composition of the Khodai Namak. So now we have some more concrete evidence that for the first time it's a sixth century. Khodai Namak, the Book of Lords, the Book of Kings, to be written. The, this oral tradition was probably partly put down for posterity as the history of Iran's past. This past had, as it appears from the Khodai Namak inspired sources, the mention of traditions in the East captured in the Avesta. Uh, Jean Kellens has again made very important observations that the Avesta provides the mythical history of the Arya and the Iranians and how the Kyanids are made into a dynasty and whatnot. If one previews the Avesta with a historical eye, one can deduce that the Yasht, specifically Yasht 5, 10, 13, and 19, among others, provides glimpses of a narrative which the Sasanians considered to be their ancient history. These hymns along the Videvda demonstrate a geographical setting for the Iranians as well. It is significant that the Avesta was put in its final form during the Sasanian period, probably very close to the time that the national history of the Iranians or the Sasanians, that is the Khodai Namak, 
uh, is also being put to writing. So it is no surprise that the Khodai Namak is heavily influenced by Avestan lore, geographically and historically. What is important to note is that this geographical horizon and kings and heroes of the past began to be associated with the Iranian plateau and its late antique or late ancient kings, the Sasanians. One can even go further and state that many of the Sasanian kings acted and conducted themselves according to the customs of the ancient kings and potentates of the Avestan Yashs. In a sense, they were playing a part in the narrative epic of the past. And I will give you one example at the end of this talk. This ancestral past is then connected with the tragic murder of Dora, which we talked about earlier, and the destruction of the uh, Zoroastrian priests and the Avesta by Alexander. Whatever and wherever this memory came from, and it could be perhaps genuine priestly tradition, which in turn also preserved Dara, the coming of Alexander is an important point in the great break from the past. Then the Arsacids make a brief, a very brief appearance in the sacred tradition with Valach, that is in the Dinkard, who is responsible for collecting uh, the sacred tradition, and then in the Shahnameh, uh, those who uh, probably most of you have come across this, uh, this passage, I read, Chokuta bud shahu ham bi khishan, nagu yad jahan dide tari khishan, az ira juz az naam nashnidam, nadar naamay khusravan didam. Since their genealogy and lineage was short, no worldly person can retell their history. From them I have heard nothing but their name, nor have I seen anything in the Book of Kings. One could argue that it may be that the Arsacids who were aware of the Achaemenids, or were uh, aware of the Achaemenids. What is interesting is the change in Arsacid imperial ideology, which pushed these Philhellens, uh, friendly to Greek cultures, lovers of Greek culture, to gravitate towards the Iranian tradition, specifically those of the Achaemenids. But this connection, even if known by the Sasanians, would have brought little interest in their preservation in the national history or tradition. In Zoroastrian memory, the Arsacids were never rehabilitated. In a unique and interesting Middle Persian text, this is the MU manuscript, there is a short apocalyptic text, the memory of the Arsacids make an appearance. I quote, and the third, the brazen branch which you Zoroaster saw is the rulership of the Arsacids, Ashkianian, is manifested, where they conducted themselves sinfully and ruled Iran Shah in the manner of Alexander of evil lineage, and they will destroy the good religion. This clear indictment of the Arsacids, however a late Pahlavi text may be, suggests a disdain for this dynasty which ruled the Iranian plateau for almost five centuries. And probably by Alexander, they're including the Seleucids. So there's a 500 year period of rulership which is just condensed into very little and then another past is created. By the late Sasanian, five minutes, thank you. So by the late Sasanian period, a sacred history was refashioned which reused ancient monuments of uh, the Iranian plateau with a Western type tradition from Eastern Iran, coordinating and moving the sacred history and location from the East to the Iranian plateau. In this way, Zoroastrianism and Zoroastrians refashioned Iran's textual and topographical history. This history was temporarily, temporarily removed from what the Judeo-Christian tradition knew and what the Greco-Romans had remembered. This new historical orientation had ideological underpinnings which gave cause to the Sasanian interaction with their Eastern and Western neighbors, meaning the Romans and the Turks. Um, since I have five minutes, I'll just rapidly talk to, rather than actually read. Uh, well, not rapidly talk, but uh, According to uh, Persian tradition, which is based on this reconstruction of late Sasanian period, of course, uh, the world is divided by uh, Feridun uh, to his three sons, right? Sal, Tur, and Iraj. And of course, uh, there is a fratricide that goes on. And uh, then you might say the war of the worlds began, right? And we have uh, not only Pahlavi material related to that, but also. Uh, we have, of course, the Book of Kings telling us. Of course, in the Avesta, the Frawashis, uh, the spirits of all of these three groups are 
uh, uh, remembered kindly. So they, the Prabashis of the Aryan countries, the Turanian countries, and the Syriman countries, all of them are in fact nicely recounted. It is in the Pahlavi and later the, of course, uh, Persian literature and uh, epic texts that we see a much different, perhaps, or uh, more drastic, uh, I think, um, difficulty between these th three tribes or th three groups of people. Uh, I would say the Sasanians then saw a constructed relation of the past uh, between themselves and their neighbors, the Romans and, and their uh, other neighbors, the Turks, in a very different light. They are working within this very epic, or you might call it religious uh, historiography, where these people were there uh, related to them. And in fact, in Latin, when we are told um, by Ammianus Marcellinus and then by other classical sources, Procopius, Theophylactus Simicata in Greek, that uh, the uh, Roman or Byzantine emperors called the uh, Sasanian kings Fratri Mio, my brother, the Sasanians actually were taking this literally as their brother according to their sacred narrative. This is just not a gesture, which of course the Romans were bestowing on the Sasanians, but the Sasanians were taking it very differently. Uh, to conclude, to just uh, make an example of how these kings are playing out in this epic past and in this new historiographical tradition, uh, when Khosrow II, the last, uh, here is uh, the Grotto of Khosrow, uh, when uh, he has difficulty uh, with Vahram uh, Chubin in years 595-91, he has to run uh, to the west. And his father, Hormoz V, uh, at least in the Book of Kings, tells him, and I will skip the uh, Persian, says, if you desire to leave your land and home, then swiftly go from here to Rome and tell the Caesar, what I, in my hard-pressed condition, seek from him as aid. In that place there are men and provisions. He is well equipped with weapons and troops, but this is more important. The descendants of Feridun in that land are your kinsmen. When your affairs are in difficulty, they will come to you. And hence, I think there is actually genuine, at least historiographical construct by the seventh century that these are their kinsmen. And so, so they're operating on a very different level. To conclude, to read one passage, uh, I would say that uh, this explains much in terms of the foreign relations between the Sasanians and the Romans, which the Romans couldn't exactly understand what these guys are talking about. Uh, I would conclude with this uh, passage from Minu Gekharat, chapter 20, which gives us this late Sasanian early Islamic period view of Zoroastrian historiography. In the pure religion, it is clearly manifested that the central reason for the animosity of the Romans and the Turks towards Iranians is because of the revenge which they implanted with the killing of Iraj. Until the restoration, at the end of time, it will continue. Thank you. So thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Before to begin my talk, I would like to thank the organizers of this wonderful exhibition for their kind invitation, which gives me the opportunity to present a large public with an intriguing subject as that of early Iranian vision of heaven and uh, or with a more archaic definition, the so-called uranography, that is the vision of the Uranus, of the heaven. This intricate subject is certainly linked with Iranian celestial mythology that we can analyze on the basis of the Avestan and Middle Iranian sources, in particular from Zoroastrian Pahlavi books, and Middle Persian, Parthian, and Sogdian documents in Manichaean texts and fragments, but also with the help of a number of Arabic and medieval Latin astronomical and astrological books. Normally, it is ignored that we have certain Latin astronomical texts which contain translation from Arabic astrological texts which are full of Pahlavi words, full of Middle Iranian concepts and ideas, just in Latin. And we don't have the intermediate version in Arabic. So 
you will see that this matter is compellingly multicultural and multilinguistic, and this makes it very thrilling because it shows the high level of communication existing in antiquity in subjects as astral lore, astronomy, and astrology. In order to make things very clear, astral mythology and astrology are not the same thing. For instance, then we find an astral myth as that of Tishtria in Avesta, the star Sirius, we have no astrological ideas in it. There is no reference to any zodiacal constellation or to any geometrical figure determined by the positions of different stars and planets. As we will see more in detail, this is just a mythic event which reflects some astronomical facts, it's true. But here, astrology is completely absent. Astrology, as we can see, for instance, from the Pahlavi horoscopes of the Bundahishn, is a sort of grammar of the heaven based on a geomathematical vision of the heaven, a clear division of the ecliptic in two houses and in two signs, with a good knowledge of the planetary phenomena and of the planetary position. So, for instance, here you see Mercury, which is Tyr. A good knowledge of the movement and of the position of the single constellations and planets and of the moon, of the phenomena of the moon and of the sun, with a well-developed competence in the interpretation of the mutual geometrical positions of the planets, the luminaries, according to the different hours of the day and of the night. It's fundamental also the presence of references to the four cardines, medium celi, imum, uh, sorry, uh, medium celi, <coughs> imum celi, ascendant and descendant. So the four points of the horoscope, which in reality uh, have been misused in popular uh, tradition because, for instance, in the so-called, what we call horoscope, is not a horoscope, it's a thema. And if it is referred to the birthday of a person, it's a thema natalis. So the uh, description of the destiny of a person with regard to starting with the day of his, the day and the hour of his birth. But horoscope technically means the ascending point on the horizon. So we normally use to name horoscope what it is not an horoscope, but it is the ascendant. All these terms, this technical expression, refers to astrology and belong to a technicality, which is completely inexistent in Avestan sources, but it is part of the culture of the Middle Persian literature, and of course it was part of late antique and uh, in inevitably also Parthian and surely um, Zoroastrian Middle Persian tradition. For this reason, so, we can speak simply of Avestan celestial mythology and of early Iranian uranography if we refer to the ancient past of the Iranians. Only in Middle Iranian text we will find well-developed astrological conception, ultimately of Greek, Indian, and in particular cases also of Egyptian and Babylonian origins. These traditions were mixed or superposed to the old Iranian heritage with very interesting solutions, some of which I would like to describe today. The Western texts clearly mention the sun, Khvar, Huarek, Shaita, Khorshid, of course, in later uh, Iranian languages, the moon, Moch, the stars, star, as single bodies or in form of constellations, while no patent reference is given to the planets. This datum testifies the antiquity and, for a certain extent, the primitivism of the Avestan uranography. We can also 
underline that apparently no lunar mansion or station seems to be attested in uh, the Avesta, while 27 or 28 lunar stations or nakshatras uh, appears only in the Pahlavi text, but very probably through an Indian influence. The sun, the moon, and the stars were considered minor divine, divine beings to be properly called yasatas or venerable ones. The sixth and the seventh hymns of the Avestan corpus are in fact dedicated to the sun and the moon, while the eighth yasht is that which was offered to the yasata Tishtria, the star Sirius. This hymn is very important for our knowledge for our knowledge of old Iranian celestial mythology. The star Sirius, in fact, was represented as the rain bringer par excellence. Tishtria is the Iranian protagonist of a myth of the liberation of the waters, more or less like Indra in Vedic literature. According to his mythological cycle, the waters are imprisoned in the Vaurukasha Sea by a demon named Apaosha. Tishtria, before fighting with this demon, changes his body in that of a young, of a 15 years old man, then in that of a golden horned bull, and finally, in that of a beautiful white horse with golden ears and a golden bridle. Each transformation takes on 10 days. At this point, Tishtria descends to the Vorukasha Sea and attacks Apaosha, which is described like an horrible black horse. In its turn, also the Vorukasha Sea seems to assume the form of a mare. After a first combat during three days and nights, Tishtria is defeated and runs away, sadly lamenting his defeat. Then he prays Aura Mazda, and Aura Mazda offers a sacrifice in order to strengthen his champion, Sirius. Given with these new powers, Tishtria again moves against Apaosha and finally beats and defeats him, frees the Vorukasha Sea and the waters there imprisoned. The clouds and the mists rise from the sea and the wind and the star Satavaisa, the star having hundred servants probably, which should be identified with formal haut, Alpha Piscis Austrini, distribute the rains with the help of a pamna pat, and the rains are given to the seven parts of the world, the seven kishvars, or karshvars, as in Avesta. The second part of the Tishtar Yast was dedicated to another mythological tradition, or to the struggle of Sirius and his army, the fixed stars, against the Pyricas, the witches, also called Staro Kermo, or Star Worms, and in particular against their chief, the Pairica Dujairia, the bad year witch. I have explained this myth supposing that these Pairicas represent the shooting, the shooting stars. Sorry. Uh, in fact, these starred worms uh, are described as falling between the earth and the sky. Unfortunately, in the Pahlavi literature, they play no role, and we only know from the Bundahijn the Mush Parig, the mouse witch, called Dumbomand, tailed, which was probably a sort of comet. If this explanation of the myth is correct, a Western cosmology shows an interesting idea. The fixed stars with very regular movement of or orbit represent the cosmic order, while the shooting stars, comets, or meteors, contrarywise, represented disorder, famine, and drought. 
This solution is well fitting with the Zoroastrian dualistic patterns. It is also interesting to underline that according to the Tishtar Yasht, chapter 39, Sirius overcomes the Pyricas whom Angra Mainu flung with intention to oppose all the stars, the originators of the rains. In uh, this image, I just give the references to the meteoric showers, showing that in the uh, month in which the heliacal rising of Sirius uh, was uh, at the top, so it was very high in the uh, heaven, uh, the meteoric showers had a very high uh, evidence and presence, so that a correspondence between the presence of Sirius and uh, the presence of meteors can be really uh, assessed. In any case, uh, I would like to attract your attention on some problems connected with the cycle of uh, Tishtria. The importance given to the star Sirius is probably linked with the Mesopotamian background. In fact, Sirius is described as an arrow thrown by the best archer of the Aryans, Urksha, Ursus. While already in Sumerian documents, the star Sirius was named Mul Kak Zi Za, arrow, a word which was explained in Akkadian with the forms Shiltahu and Shukudu. Thus, it is certainly interesting to note that also Vedic Tisya to be identified with Sirius. Coopere is an archer who cooperates with Rudra and Krishanu in the Rig Veda. In China, because also I have given here the Chinese constellation, we have the celestial emperor who is Tian Lang, who is the archer again. So we have in any case the same pattern, the star Sirius or is a star or is the archer or it is in any case connected with a, a constellation which has the form of a bow with an arrow. This happens from China to Egypt. To <clears throat> it is clear that the Iranian peoples made a strong re-elaboration of the myth of the liberation of the waters, and Tishtria was given with a particular function according to a special view of the sky. Thus, as the brightest star of heaven, he was called the Lord and overseer of all the stars, as Zarathustra is the Lord or the overseer of, the, of men. In addition, we must consider the strong antagonism attested in the Zoroastrian cosmology between fixed stars and shooting stars, strictly connected with the cycle of the liberation of the waters. I would like also to remark that just as the Vedic tradition employed its own tools in order to rework the myth of the liberation of the waters, so did the Iranian tradition. The elements that combined to shape the image and role of Tishtria were the peculiar qualities of the star Sirius he took on in ancient Iran. This could well account for the evident insubstantiality of Tishtria's Vedic counterpart, Tisya, who belonged to a different context and tradition and remained a divine figure of minor importance. Before to conclude the presentation of this myth, we can add few remarks. First, the reference to the three transformations of Sirius, each one of 10 days, clearly evokes his heliacal rising when the star, day after day, started to rise earlier then the rising of the sun, and then a little bit earlier every day, <coughs> so that after one month, it was high in the sky when the sun was rising. And this phenomenon, which is repeated every year, was considered substantially, substantial, fundamental in many ancient cultures, in Egypt and in Mesopotamia. <coughs> 
The reference to the 30 days shows that the Iranians knew a month of 30 days since early antiquity, although we cannot dispute about the structure of the primitive Mazdian calendars because of a lack of sources. Three, the observation of Sirius heliacal rising was taken as an omen, referring to the forecoming year and its season, as expressly, openly stated in the Tishtar Yasht. This is, again, not astrology, but celestial divination. Four, only when Sirius was very high in the sky, he started to fight against the meteoric showers, which in fact are and were very impressive, not in the month of Tishtar, but a little bit later. Now, we can just mention the other important Avestan stars and constellation. The only constellations clearly attested in the Avestan text are Haptoiringa, Haftoreng in Pahlavi text, identified with Ursa Major, Tishtriaene, the Canis Minor or Lesser Dog, Pauiriaeni, the Pleiades. Other asterisms have not been identified apart from Hapta Srawo, which I suppose to be Ursa Minor. We know only the names of some of the principal stars, Tishtria, Sirius, Vanant, Vega, Upa Pauiria, Aldebaran, Sata Waisa, probably Fomalhaut. The main reason for this is probably the scarcity of texts related to uranography and astronomy in the Avesta. Another star, according to Henning, should be Merezu, identified with a polar star. Uh, Henning, uh, insisted on this identification, also trying to deduce uh, a chronology of the text. Uh, in fact, he said, uh, uh, I will find Merezu, sorry, okay, here, should be placed as a pole star, but in reality, polos in Greek, uh, does not mean polar star. Five minutes, okay. Uh, when uh, we have references to the polos in Greek astronomical text, uh, Greek astronomers clearly say polos kenos esti. The pole is empty. It, technically, we don't have any polar star from the end of the second millennium BC till 800 AD. Tuban I, was about the third millennium AD, the real pole polar star. And here you see the Polaris. So for, because of Tuban, the Indologists had enormous problems because some scholars try to say, oh, Druva in Sanskrit is the polar star, but it is not clear. It is not called Druva Tara or Druva Taraka. I simply say Druva, the fixed, the peg in the sky. And so if they had the polar star, they should have seen a polar star. So they were in the Arctic area. This was Tilak, probably well known to some of you. And uh, for this reason, they composed the Rig Veda in the third millennium BC. But more simply, Druva was the peg of the heaven, as the axis mundi has a, a peak, and this peak is in line with the peg of the heaven. It's unnecessary to have a real, a real star. This happened later. So in Pahlavi later texts, when we have Mechigach, this is the polar, probably the polar star. But at that time, they had a real polar star. In, in antiquity is unnecessary. So probably when we, found, when we find references to Merezu, Merezu just represents a cosmological peg in correspondence with the Taera, with the peak of uh, uh, <coughs> the highest mountain in the middle of the uh, Aerian Avaeja, the original homeland of the Aryans. Uh, before to, to conclude, uh, I would like to sorry, to uh, underline uh, uh, one interesting fact, uh, which 
shows that the Iranians, when they adopted the names of the planets, strongly followed the interpretatio mesopotamica. So they clearly had an idea of what the Babylonians had done, and they did as the Greeks made. So Aura Mazda was the planet, the name of the planet corresponding to Marduk, as the Greek denominated the same planet, Zeus. So this was the ratio. It was uh, the rationale, it was followed. But the problem we have, uh, it's a theological problem, for the Zoroastrians in Middle Persian literature, the planets are demons. So we have a demon named Ormazd in Pahlavi text. We have a demon named Anahid. We have a demon named Vahram. Which, which one is the explanation? The explanation, I think, is very simple. The Zoroastrians, um, in any case, the Iranian people learned the, the planets thanks to the Mesopotamian astronomers and observers of the heaven. Then they adopted the terminology. But at that time, they did not know how to manage with these strange bodies. With uh, later speculation, they place the planets in the same family of the shooting stars. The shooting stars disappear in Pahlavi text, and the planets take their position. In fact, Pahlavi text associates the planets with the Parigan, which is the translation of the Avestan Pyrica. So we can give an explanation for this strange phenomenon and we can also remark that the Zoroastrians did not change the name of the planets because these names were too old, too ancient, so deeply radicated in the tradition that it was practically impossible to change again. Um, this shows the enormous uh, uh, importance of the uh, Iranian tradition uh, in the intercultural relation with other cultures, also because the planets uh, played a fantastic role in the Sasanian speculation, in particular, and I'm closing, uh, on the doctrine of a so-called um, conjunction of, uh, of the two planets, Saturn and uh, Jupiter, which was a thrilling subject for all the medieval astrologers till the e European Renaissance. And uh, this was probably an invention of the uh, Sasanian uh, scholars. Uh, concluding, we have to remark that history of science and history of the astral law and astronomy and astrology in Sasanian Iran shows that an intellectual body of astrologers was in the position to read and to comment Greek sources, Indian sources, and to mix also them because we have Greek texts which uh, contain part which were calculated in the Sasanian period with Sasanian expression and also a lot of Arabic sources depending on the uh, Middle Persian tradition. So we are at the center of a really uh, thrilling crossing point for the culture of late antiquity and of early Middle Age. Thank you. Before I begin, I would like to thank the conference organizers for having me here today. Uh, speaking at SOAS is a real dream come true. Um, so there's good news and bad news. It tends to be in my talks. There's going to be no philology, no foreign words, but instead, what you get is some postmodernism. So be prepared. Historically, the vast bulk of scholarship in Zoroastrian studies has focused on reconstructing the history of pre-modern Zoroastrianism. Consequently, little formal attention has been paid to our sociology of knowledge, that is, to questions of location, position, relation, and boundaries in the present regarding our knowledge production as scholars. My talk today, therefore, seeks to raise a number of questions related to the insider-outsider problem in the study of religion. Is the insider-outsider divide to be seen in ontological, epistemological, or in social terms? 
what are the intellectual, disciplinary, and social implications of recognizing that knowledge of various types is distributed unevenly along the insider-outsider divide? How do we, as scholars, conceive of speaking and writing about pre-modern stages of a still living religion, especially a small minority one, where our cultural capital is highly sought after by various insider groups to legitimate their own communal and political agendas? How do we meaningfully and responsibly engage with questions of faith, theology, and the diverse practices of living Zoroastrians in Iran, India, and the global diasporas, while both acknowledging contemporary experiences and yet maintaining critical distance and scholarly authority? I would like to argue that these, amongst other disciplinary questions, need to be addressed in order to develop more reflexive and critical theories and methods for the study of Zoroastrianism in the 21st century. When I have spoken about the insider-outsider problem with many of my colleagues, I often hear the old refrain that, regrettably, they don't do living religion. They study old texts. I do too. Such viewpoints, while sounding perfectly reasonable at face value, do not acknowledge that access to knowledge for both the past and the present is always negotiated in social terms. While we usually pay lip service to respecting the self-perceptions of insiders, their contemporary beliefs and practices are often dismissed entirely or treated as mere data to be mined for archaisms that relate to the Zoroastrian past. And yet, many of us work in archives in India that are controlled by Zoroastrians, the Kama Institute and the Merji Rana Library spring to mind, and we give lectures at conferences like the present one, which are sponsored by and attended by insiders. Besides the archive and the conference, there are multiple sites of intervention where insiders and outsiders interact. For example, the classroom, religious community centers, publications, and of course, museum exhibits. In his pioneering work on living Zoroastrianism, Philip Krembrook produced a typology of Parsi insiders. I thought it might be instructive, perhaps even provocative, to impose a similar typology of us scholars of Zoroastrianism for the insider-outsider divide. I don't believe a word I'm saying from this point on. <laughs> In the sense that I'm just using the typology as a heuristic device and maybe even a cheap rhetorical tool, but be, be that as it may. My quadripartite typology is ultimately derived from the sociological work of Buford Juncker and Raymond Gold from the 1950s, very modern and adapted by Kim Knott for religious studies in her chapter, Insider-Outsider Perspectives in the Routledge Companion to the Study of Religion, edited by our own John Hinnells. Ranging from a quote-unquote complete participant or full insider to a complete observer or full outsider, we can add the categories of observer as participant or occasionally embedded outsider and participant as observer or critical insider. Let me begin with the complete participant or full insider. A member of a class of scholars trained communally and seen as religiously and publicly authoritative. The rabbis, muftis, pundits, etc., of other religious communities. Drawing on traditional sources of authority and primarily speaking from within the tradition, this category might seem like the most straightforward of the four in the Zoroastrian context. But it is in many ways the most ambiguous, since some of the most illustrious scholar priests of the 20th century, like Dr. Dr. Kotwal, and Dr. Dr. Jamas Pasa have doctorates from Western institutions of learning, this one included, which problematize the often absolute categories of insider-outsider knowledge, power, and authority. As Dr. Dastur Kotwal himself has noted in an academic publication, we have priests now performing their rituals using Gellner's editions. Edition. In addition, we have a number of productive monographs produced in collaboration with insiders and outsiders. Dr. Dr. Kotwal's philological work with Philip Krembrook and Almut Hinze come to mind, as well as Erva Dr. Ramyar Karanjia's work on death rituals with Dorothea Ludikins and his collaborations with Michael Stausberg. I illustrate these examples to suggest that our knowledge production for both contemporary and pre-modern Zoroastrianism is shared across the so-called insider-outsider chasm. And in that sense, the idea of using or citing either the quote-unquote insider perspective or knowledge as an unmediated access to quote-unquote traditional or authentic learning and erudition is not simply suspect, but epistemologically untenable. The history of Orientalism with regard to the study of Zoroastrianism is replete with examples of collaborative work between Western scholars and their Zoroastrian counterparts. 
these hybridized intellectual collaborations produced a form of knowledge that cannot be simply reduced to, quote, Western or Eastern discourse, that of the academy versus that of the madrasa, but something quintessentially modern, blended, and implicated in questions of power and authority. Let me turn to the other end of the spectrum, the complete observer or full outsider. The methodological claims associated with this type of scholar generally focus on objectivity, neutrality, and social scientific and philological rather than religious or theological approaches to their object of study. Any number of scholars might fall within this category, regardless of whether they work on pre-modern or contemporary issues. Michael Stausberg, Maria Matsuk, Jean Kellens, Antonio Panaino, Alberto Cantera all come to mind. Jean Kellens, for example, has made a point of stating that he works on the quote unquote, archaic mind of the old Avesta, an ancient Iranian religion and literature, rather than on Zoroastrianism or the Zoroastrian tradition. And he has stated quite unequivocally that, and I quote, we must consider the Avesta as a mythological book, that of an archaic religion with which nobody today has familiar sentiments, purely and simply because despite all possible and imaginable traditions, the evolution of thought over three millennia has wrought deep, inexorable, and unconscious changes. For Kellens, we are all outsiders to the world of the Avesta, regardless of our ascriptive or chosen identities, as Zoroastrians, as scholars, or as Zoroastrian scholars. Mr. Anushirvani's comments today capture this point quite elegantly. Kellens' quest for methodological independence from the later Zoroastrian tradition has, and will continue to have, a profound impact on how much fidelity we see in the later Zoroastrian hermeneutical traditions vis-a-vis -vis the Gathas. Regardless of whether we choose to read them as products of group composition of inherited Indo-Iranian poetic forms or as the ipsissima verba of a prophet's revolutionary message. Let me be perfectly clear. This is not a critique of Kellens, but rather an acknowledgement that what is good for the goose may not in this case be good for the gander. What might be healthy for old Avestan studies from a particular methodological perspective based on a theoretical position of scientific objectivity may not be productive for the study of later Zoroastrian texts commenting on the old Avesta from another methodological point of view, one of hermeneutics. We are back to the old debate between the causal explanations of social scientists and the hermeneutical understanding of humanists. The more you read the old Avesta in an autonomous fashion from the rest of the Zoroastrian textual legacy, the harder it becomes to claim historical continuities and to then read Zoroastrianism as a single continuous quote unquote tradition. Albert de Jong discussed this issue of approach to early Zoroastrianism in his book in the late 1990s, and it remains critical for us to grapple with the social implications of forms of our knowledge production that nominally rely on shared philological tools, but espouse radically different intellectual goals. This may sound like scholarship internal debates unconnected to the insider-outsider problem, but I assure you that is hardly the case. We have Zoroastrian reading groups in Boston and Houston, for example, comparing the various philological editions of the Avesta in order to create meta-translations of scripture which appeal to them personally, but have little fidelity to the original, quote-unquote, philologically rigorous translations. They do so by simply collapsing the methodological genealogies that Professor Kellens takes such pains to lay out in order to distinguish his approach from many of his contemporaries, whom he sees as lacking critical distance from the modernist hagiographies of insiders. Let me now discuss the category of observer as participant, or occasionally embedded outsider, as I like to term it. Often associated with the empathetic approach to religion espoused by the phenomenologists, this approach is also based on Max Weber's notion of verstehen, or understanding, with the process of inquiry resulting in the researcher being able to put him or herself in the shoes of the quote-unquote other. Value-free translation of foreign concepts, beliefs, and mores is often seen as the goal of such an approach, what Ninian Smart termed methodological agnosticism. That is the requirement of neutrality with a concomitant need to bracket out truth claims and judgments on the part of the researcher. As Eileen Barker, one of the world's great specialists on new religious movements, formerly known as cults, has said, passing value judgments should be an enterprise that is separate from social science. This particular approach was very popular in the 70s and 80s prior to the postmodern movement, which called into question both the dichotomies between inside and outside in terms of constructed identities and the related dichotomies of self and other, subject and object, subjectivity and objectivity, and the relationship between power and knowledge. <laughs> 
Once again, a number of our colleagues might fall within this category as they attempt to work on and with Zoroastrian insiders on a variety of topics. James Boyd, John Hinnells, and Philip Krembrook are probably the three scholars who have done the most sustained work with Parsis. As any of our scholars who have dealt with members of the various Zoroastrian communities can attest, the ability to remain neutral is less of a question than the definition of neutrality in the first place. Michael Stausberg, in his review of John Hinnell's Zoroastrians in Britain, raises the question of Hinnell's involvement in Zoroastrian communal life in Manchester, but the lack of any mention of such in his book. While Professor Hinnell's responded in his Zoroastrian, in his The Zoroastrian Diaspora, one would have liked to know more about his personal involvement with the various diaspora groups and their influence on his research and his on their organizational governance. The challenge, of course, being that many of the most important revelations of community politics and governance were surely revealed to Professor Hinnells in confidence, often in people's homes where he was a guest. Here we have the classical challenge of ethnography. I'm sure over his long career, Professor Hinnells, more than any of us, has been asked for his quote-unquote opinion or help in adjudicating social and doctrinal issues that hold tremendous contemporary significance for real people's lives. In his co-authored book on interviews, Professor Krembrook acknowledged the lacuna of liberal and secular Zoroastrians in his work when he stated that, and I quote, the impossibility of holding an in-depth interview on religion with someone who is wholly uninterested in the subject caused an important section of the community to be left unrepresented here, end quote. I would agree with Professor Krembrook that it is impossible to study secular members of an ethno-religious community, when for many of us scholars, Zoroastrianism is often seen as a primarily trans-historical rel religious entity reducible to certain unique core beliefs and practices that are seen as constituting its quote-unquote essence. This is not a critique of Professor Krayenbrook's methodology in that book, nor does he hold such essentializing views, but simply a reflection on how the construction of our quote, and quote, outsider categories of analysis affect the definition of who counts as a representative insider. And the fact that our disciplinary location, generally as philologists and historians of religion, fundamentally shapes not only what we decide is worth studying, but also whom. It seems to me that Parsi corporate identity, for example, could just as easily be studied as a Western Indian colonial and post-colonial mercantile phenomenon with religion being just one variable amongst a host of other more historical, geographical, and materialist concerns. But then we scholars of religion would have to, at least partially, cede Parsi identity to anthropologists, historians, sociologists, and economists, more insiders and outsiders, just in this case, in the disciplinary sense. Let me turn to the last of the four categories of scholars, the participant as observer, or the quote-unquote critical insider. Here we might include Jamshid Choksi, Burzin Wagmar, and myself, as scholars of religion who are from the community. What distinguishes this latter group from that of Dastur Kotwal and Ervat Karanjia is that while both groups are published and publishing in academic venues using mu mutually agreed upon scholarly methodologies, the latter group sees its authority being primarily derived from institutional affiliations of a communal and sacral nature versus the former group who derives its authority from the Western Academy. These two groups of insiders problematize the question of scholarly writing on Zoroastrianism by highlighting the differences between their primary identities and discourses distinguished along the lines of normative, prescriptive, and didactic claims about religious matters versus descriptive or critical ones, respectively. This distinction is also highly porous for the priest scholars because they often wear two hats. The largely embedded nature of such a positionality is well illustrated using Professor Choksi's research on the Zoroastrians of Sri Lanka, when he, where he has discussed the importance and influence of Kekushro Choksi in the communal affairs of a tiny diaspora community. Family matters indeed. My own experiences with the insider-outsider question could fill a talk just on their own, but I will cite two examples to illustrate the often politically fraught nature of complex academic and communal identities. In a trip to Mumbai a few years ago, Kojeste Mistri asked me to speak to a group of priests at a fire temple. 10 to 15 priests from their 20s to their 60s sat arms folded in a semicircle and proceeded to ask me questions, grilled me politely, on a variety of historical, doctrinal, and sociolo sociological questions. My discomfort was probably most pronounced when a young priest asked me if he could tell his temple goers that intermarried couples would not be reunited in the afterlife because one believed in reincarnation 
and one in true Zoroastrian notions of heaven and hell. I glibly responded, as I do often, that I had no way of verifying their ultimate metaphysical destinations, being simply a scholar of old texts. I used the same neutrality discourse as many of the outsider scholars. And I proceeded to suggest, as is my usual modus operandi, that the Zoroastrian theologians writing in Pallavi have much to say about contemporary issues. I do that all the time. At the time, I was struck by the fact that quote unquote traditional priests wanted a young, Western educated, secular Parsi to tell them what their theology was all about. Neo Orientalism is alive and well. But it was only later that the full import of the interaction struck me when one of the young priests offered me a ride home and wanted to discuss the controversial topics of boundary maintenance more privately as he expressed grave reservations about publicly supporting the quote unquote orthodox line taken by most employed priests in Mumbai regarding the children of mixed marriages. Our opinions as scholars count far more than we often realize simply because of the powerful legacies of Orientalism and colonialism. And in that sense, even my dodge of looking back to pre-modern Zoroastrianism has very real political import, even if I did not realize it or fully realize it as I was trying to be so self-reflexive about whether I had any authority to speak for and hence reify a supposedly unbroken trans-historical theological tradition quote unquote, untainted by the Orientalist intervention and modernist reimaginings of pre-modern religious discourse. My second example is from 2009, when I was living in Southern California and was asked by the California Zoroastrian Center to conduct religious education classes on a few Sundays for Iranian Zoroastrians interested in learning more about their faith from a Parsi scholar of Pallavi. I was of course concerned that they understood that my classes would be strictly the educational rather than theological in any way. But I agreed because it seemed like an excellent opportunity to interact with Iranian Zoroastrians who I'd had little contact with while living in Bombay and Boston. While I read sections of the Menoe Khrad in translation with the four to five young men, I observed that their knowledge of the Zoroastrianism as I typically experience it with Parsis seemed rather impressionistic. Their names were ambiguous, no Ali's or Muhammad's, but I slowly got the impression that I was being tested by Ali Jafri's followers embedded among the Iranian Zardushtis. They, of course, wanted to know my views about conversion. And I, Parsis want to know about intermarriage and conversion. And I did my usual song and dance. It's complicated. We have to define what we mean by religion. We have to define what we mean by ethnicity. We have to look at religious practices and identities contextually and geographically. Armenia, Georgia, and Central Asia being different from Iran and blah, blah. So I didn't answer the question. In both encounters, the outsider academic power and authority of the ethnically insider academic was being engaged with by either insiders or outsiders, even I'm not sure which, to serve political and social ends far beyond what I was trained for as a philologist in my interactions with them. At this point in my quasi-autobiographical and largely anecdotal typology, many of you scholars are probably wondering where you might fall on this spectrum. I would love to know where my California compatriots, Jenny Rose and Turaj Darioi would locate themselves. They have the best stories. And some of you undoubtedly would reject the premise and value of such typologies altogether, as I actually do. I hope to have shown that the very antinomies suggested by the insider-outsider divide are deeply problematic if we choose to understand such identities along strictly ontological or epistemological lines, rather than as ascriptive or chosen identities, which are fundamentally social in nature, and hence deeply powerful. Ironically, their power is often reified by the very agents tasked with examining them critically, us scholars. I would like to suggest that the social view of identity that I espouse must be consistent both for our object of study, Zoroastrian knowledge and cultural production, in the past and the present, and for ourselves as scholarly subjects. So rather than argue that we're talking about absolute identities, I would instead suggest the distinctions between these four types, and we can add many, there are many more types here that I didn't discuss, are always contextual and often shifting. Much like the very diverse Zoroastrian identities that we encounter, reconstruct, and define in temporal and geographical terms in the past, when we as scholars make Zoroastrian identity. In fact, many of the identity shifts of us as scholarly actors are directly related to our ability to acquire or maintain privileged access to knowledge, resources, and hence authority in the present. I'm well aware of the irony of this line of argumentation on my part, 
which could be read as self-justificatory in the extreme, given my positionality as both a Parsi and an academic, hence my ability to participate in authorized discourse on both sides of the insider-outsider divide. Pierre Bourdieu eloquently argued for the importance of symbolic capital with regard to these questions of representational power and group legitimation when he stated, and I quote, in the struggle to impose the legitimate vision in which science itself is inevitably caught up, agents possess power in proportion to their symbolic capital, i.e. in proportion to the recognition they receive from a group. The positive reception of this talk on the sociology of our knowledge by you, my insider colleagues, as well as you, my insider community members, will determine my symbolic capital in our shared intellectual enterprise. Cheeky attempts at self-referentiality aside, sim symbolic capital in broader disciplinary terms is precisely what is at stake for all of us insider scholars of Zoroastrianism in the early 21st century. Increasingly in our contemporary academic world, Hyper-specialized and esoteric fields such as ours find it increasingly difficult to transfer newly acquired specialist knowledge efficiently as we leave the world of the guild and enter that of the corporation. As representational strategies, and here I am speaking about the university, as representational strategies for studying the world's religious traditions have become increasingly complex, sophisticated, and nuanced, we in Zoroastrian studies must become relentlessly, self, relentlessly reflexive in order to understand and be able to articulate the broader intellectual genealogies of our respective academic projects, whether we agree with each other's or not, it's not the point. A field of study that does not engage in such an intellectual movement risks losing all forms of institutional support, representational power, and disciplinary legitimacy. Ultimately, we are all writing the autobiography of both Zoroastrian studies and Zoroastrianism, in the past and the present. And in that sense, the need to maintain our symbolic capital as scholars of Zoroastrianism is critical at a moment in history when we now potentially face disciplinary extinction in our insider world, the academy. Thank you. Um, we've had a very varied selection of papers. I, although there's a there's a broad title up there. Uh, I can hardly think of three papers more, more different from one another. Um, but if uh, anyone can come up with a question that actually links them together, that would be particularly brilliant. Anyway, the, the, floor, the floor is open. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You have religious ceremonies in the Iranian world which are centered around the fire. And these were in open air, and for fire to be visible, it had to be at night. So these ceremonies, what, when they were officiating, they had a star-studded sky above them. Mm. And for the priest to communicate with his followers, he had to point out to some celestial bodies. Mm. He had the moon, which was very visible, and it was uh, qualified as Gauchitra, and you had the uh, stars, qualified as Ashchitra, um, and especially Sirius, which is the most, the brightest star yeah. in the sky at nighttime. But it seems that on the Iranian side, very quickly they realize that you have Sirius and two other uh, stars that form the winter triangle, Betelgeuse and Procyon. Yeah, but they are not mentioned in the text. They are not mentioned in the text, but what you have is in the coinage. Uh, you have three dots that I think reflect that, and this is a very powerful, auspicious sign that then carries on. Tamerlane has it, the Ottoman have it, the uh, dervish orders have it tattooed on their arms, and sometimes it's three dots, but they always come back to the fact that you have an equilateral triangle. And it seems that there was something magical about the equilateral triangle that made it auspicious. And that is something that does, is not reflected in the, um, uh, in the Mesopotamian side or in the Egyptian side. I, I think uh, that's, that's how I see it. Do you want to respond? Well, uh, it's, a, it's an, a working hypothesis. You can, you can try to develop it, but we need uh, 
uh, supportive arguments. So uh, we can, uh, uh, with regard also to archaeoastronomy and astronomical reconstruction, we can explain everything. I could explain that these flowers stay here and that they are in line with the heliacal horizon <laughs> or the heliacal setting of a number of constellations. And I think in three we here, we could invent uh, a full uh, omina system. But uh, this is the problem we have when we attach these problems, because the risk to develop too much without supportive evidence is too strong. So I, what I tried to, to do was just to underline what we have in the sources and what we can actually deduce and seriously present as reasonably acceptable for the scientific community. The rest is a little bit is more dangerous. So this is my, is what, can, and also because your um, references uh, are to stars, which unfortunately are not mentioned in uh, Pahlavi literature, in uh, uh, Sogdian literature, in all the Middle Iranian literature, they do not appear. So uh, it's, a, it's a problem. Uh, um, of course, if we will find, it would be a good, a good solution. OK, I think we have a question at the back there. Malcolm? No, no, excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah, but I was, I was calling upon another questioner, actually, behind you. But in a moment, in a moment. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor Sims-Williams. Uh, my question is specifically to you, Han. Um, in a sense, first of all, I congratulate you for bringing this sensitive topic out in the public domain. Uh, because uh, I think it's very, I think you touched in many sort of difficult, sensitive issues, which I think both the academics face as well as members of the community. But my question Especially you, in question and answer sessions. That's correct. <laughs> but my, I, I won't put you in that, in that sort of sensitive issue with my, with my question. But my question is this, that uh, first of all, as a community and, and as, a, as a religious community, are we, are we rather slightly unique in this matter? Because or does this issue arise with other faith communities vis-a-vis -vis the academics? Because usually the faith communities have their own religious structure when it comes to discourse within certain matters in the community. And my second question on the same subject. May I answer? Quick. Sorry, yeah. Go on. The only thing unique about Zoroastrians yeah. is how obsessed they are with being unique. All right, fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the reason why I asked that question. And I, I'm, I, it may sound like I'm saying this with my Parsi hat. I'm actually saying this with my academic hat. I, yeah. Because all these categories apply. These are categories. I mean, they, they can be applied from any of these communities. Yes. And I think especially... For Zoroastrians, I would say it's extremely important to recognize that there are minority communities that are maybe not quite as old, so not as important, but they are much smaller than us with much greater yeah. us, see? Uh, much greater um, a risk of being, of going extinct. The Mandeans are a fantastic yeah. example. The Samaritans, for instance. Yeah, I mean, no, hence the rationale behind the question, because we work within this, what's called the interfaith domain, and they have a similar issue. But the, uh, leading on from that question is this, that are the academics then trained I within the field to answer these questions? The reason is this, coming back to Professor Hinell's what you mentioned, because when he was asked his certain opinions, he used to always keep mum in public. And so at times you've seen some of the other academic scholars who have ventured into the public domain to give their opinion and it's slightly got into troubled waters. Well, this, it's actually a really important question, right? When we talk about Zoroastrianism, if we choose to think of Zoroastrianism primarily as an ancient religious tradition, then yes, they're very well equipped to tell us about everything in, in the context of philology, history, astrology. If we're talking about it as Zoroastrianism as well as a, as a living tradition, then it gets more problematic because we just don't have the, the, the anthropologists, the sociologists. This is why students often come to me and say, oh, I want to read the Gathas. It's like, oh, come on. Let's, you know, there's so much more interesting stuff going on here with living people before they get wiped out. I mean, and it, it's not a matter of choosing one over the other. It's a matter of having, of, of recognizing that our interests, I want to read the Gathas. 
is a quest for origins. It has a certain romantic aspect to it. A decision to say, I want to study the present has an aspect of saying, we want to preserve the community. We want to, pres or we want to uh, understand this small little identity as it's dying out. There, there's, not, there's no such thing as apolitical reading. Everything is political. And so we just have to recognize that and be willing to say, these are our politics. And I don't mean politics in the, the grand sense, but we have to recognize where we are located and what our projects are. In many senses, I feel uncomfortable with the typology I gave for the scholars because I see four or five of them sitting in a row and they, I don't think they have the same intellectual projects. I don't mean that in any negative way. They're doing different things. There's so few of us that each of us represents a sort of school of thought in our own right, and that's also very problematic. Thank you. Uh, now, sir, there's a, a microphone coming. As I said, uh, this time I have a real question for Professor Daryoy, uh, but before doing that, I wanted to just uh, thank uh, Johan for mentioning my name, and I'm uh, really very glad that he survived all the Jaffrey implants in Southern California. <laughs> uh, the, his uh, presentation is, uh, truly deserves to become a landmark uh, uh, account of the issue that he addressed. Now, my uh, question uh, is, uh, do you agree, Professor Daryai, that uh, during the time of uh, Shapur the first or Shapuri Ekom, uh, early on during Sasanian time, uh, Shapur actually became uh, uh, to Mani, the uh, founder of Maniki Manichism, or Manichaean religion and supported him financially and uh, otherwise to the point that Mani dedicated one of his books to him, calling it Shapur Gan. And also during Kawad the First, or Qobad uh, Yekom, he became a Mazdaki actually and gave away the treasures, became a communist basically, gave, gave away the treasures of uh, Sasanian. Uh, which was tremendous, uh, some of them, of course. And also, I think one of the Yazgirds, during one of the Yazgirds, could have been Yazgird the uh, third. <coughs> there was a convention, the first convention of Christians took place in Solukie. If that's the case, what conclusion should we draw from all that that happened during Sasanian time? Uh, third century is different from fourth century, that is different from fifth, sixth, and seventh. Uh, religiously, things are quite dynamic. This is a dynamic empire. It's not uh, a static empire that is unchanging from the third to the seventh century. Different things are developing. So some, I mean, these are various religions competing at an important time. The king sometimes plays one against another one, try to keep power, and at other times they lose power or you know the things go out of hand or they use them so things are quite fluid and things are changing continuously so we have to try to actually explain this change rather than say here's the Sasanian empire this is what it is I agree with you the, the first second and the third supposition okay thank you very much uh, we've now just about reached the uh, the, the official lunchtime and i think therefore we've had one question to each uh, of our panel which is just perfect so thank you very much